Hi, everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. There's reverberation as if you're on, on your phone and your computer. Good afternoon, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. So hello, Partnering for Vaccine Equity, learning community members and others working on vaccine equity. Welcome to this afternoon's learning event. I am Jenny Haley. I'm part of the group learning team for the learning community. And on behalf of all of us at the Urban Institute, thank you for joining us. This is the second of four sessions in a series on increasing vaccine confidence and the role of motivational interviewing techniques uh, called Understanding and Addressing Vaccine Confidence. Our session today is entitled Motivational Interviewing, What Is It and Why Should My Vaccine Equity Program Consider It? And we're glad to have featured speaker Ken Resnikow with us. If you were able to join us last month at the first of these sessions, you'll know we're in for a royal, lot of really useful information from Ken, and I'll introduce him more in just a moment. But first, I will go through um, some of our typical procedures about how the session will work. You've all been muted upon entry to the session. Please stay on mute unless you're speaking to keep the discussion going without accidental interruptions. The chat room feature is open today. We encourage you to use it. I see some of you are introducing yourselves, which is great, or you can type a question for our speaker at any time. We've also reserved some time at the end of the session for Q&A. We offer live interpretation from English to Spanish during our events. If you would like to listen to the Spanish language channel, please click on the globe icon in the Zoom taskbar, and that's at the bottom of your screen. And finally, as with all of our learning events, we will post the slides and a recording of this event on our community website and circulate those through the digests that go out through the CDC managed adult vax program listserv, which all program members should be a part of. If you have technical difficulties at any point during the session, please send an email to our community managers inbox vax equity learning at urban.org. We'll be watching the end box and we'll try to help you as quickly as we can. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Kenneth Resnikow. He's the Erwin Rosenstock Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health and Professor of Pediatrics in the School of Medicine, the Associate Director for Community Engagement and Health Disparities Research at the University of Michigan Robel Cancer Center and Chief Scientific Lead at the University's Center for Health Communications Research. His work includes designing and evaluating behavior change programs for a wide range of health behaviors, including vaccine take-up, and increasingly entails novel behavioral tailoring and the incorporation of e-health technology to enhance the impact of health messages. And he has a focus on ethnic, racial, and underserved populations, particularly African-Americans, Native Alaskans, Hispanics, and Middle Eastern North Africans. As I mentioned earlier, he was also our speaker for a great session last month. If you missed that, the recording is available on our community website, but it's okay. You don't have to have been at that uh, to attend this one. So we know you'll still be in a, for a lot of useful information today. So again, really glad you're all joining us and I will send it over to you, Ken, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Host disabled, I need permission to screen share.
someone working on that. There we go. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jenny, and all the organizers that helped pull this together. I'm really happy to be with you again for part two. Um, I'm going to give you today a very quick review of what we covered in part one, and then I'll start to talk about how motivational interviewing can be used to help people overcome their ambivalence and hesitance to get vaccinated. So let's start with a couple of terms. Let's talk about resistance ambivalence and reactance. They're all related, but they're tapping something a little different. So let's start with resistance. Resistance is energy that the person has pushing against the vaccine. And this includes both um, rational and affective feelings about why they don't like or trust the vaccine, like, oh, it just feels like it was rushed to the market. Even if they don't know how many months it took, they just have a general sort of intuition, um, affective uh, feeling that this doesn't feel safe to them. And then sometimes they have concrete um, either information gaps or misinformation, such as, as we talked about a few weeks ago, that Bill Gates is injecting microchips into the um, little vial of vaccine before you get it. So resistance is pushing against the vaccine. Ambivalence is a mix of resistance and positive motivation. It's this gray area. On one hand, I want to. On the other hand, I'm scared. I have mixed feelings. I am ambivalent. Now, in a few minutes, we'll talk about motivational interviewing strategies. Well, with the ambivalent person, we're going to do a lot of what we call double-sided reflections. Part of you wants the protection offered by the vaccine. However, part of you is scared it's not safe. So as we talk about our skills later this afternoon, we're going to emphasize for the ambivalent person using that double-sided approach. On one hand, you want it. On the other hand, you're scared. Now, reactance is a very specific thing that is a sister or cousin of resistance. Reactance is the specific response a patient or program participant um, feels about how you communicated with them. So if you use too judgmental of a tone or you use controlling language, which we say you must, you should, you have to, we're, we're very wary of that type of language. But if you use that, you must, you better, you have to, you should be ashamed of yourself. That sort of controlling judgmental language creates extra resistance. It's not the resistance that the person came in with. It's resistance that you caused because of your communication strategy or style. So of course, you could guess that MI is really good at not creating reactants, whereas more directive approaches where we say things like you really got to get vaccinated is going to create this reaction response. Now, in our first presentation, we talked about some personality attributes that we showed in our national survey that are associated with vaccine hesitance or vaccine resistance. All of these reactants, more traditional gender roles, dogmatism, not feeling that you can ever be wrong or information is not going to change you, and then even QAnon beliefs, um, all are associated with higher vaccine hesitance. Now we talked about some and, audience. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. There is a gray rectangle over part of your slides. Are you seeing that on your screen? I have made it go away. Correct? Oh, I'm seeing an, an, another one came up. Now it should be gone. I'm still seeing one to the right oh. side of your slides over where your mouse is now. Okay. You see something over there? I don't. Oh, boy. Um, hmm. Right where I'm circling with the mouse, you see a box? Yes. All right. Is it there on this slide as well? Oh, I do it see is. it. It is. I do oh, yeah. see it. All right. I will, um, I'm going to close out PowerPoint real quick, okay? I think this will cost us uh, just a minute. Um, let me just lower. Hmm. It's, it's a bit of a... Of a all right, let me close out PowerPoint. I'll open it again and hopefully it will be gone. Thank you. All right. 
talks amongst yourselves. <laughs> All right. All right. Let me just close out PowerPoint. Open up PowerPoint. Hold on, guys. Any luck with it going away? All right. Is it gone? I am still seeing it. Um... Hmm. You know what I've never we seen do this. is uh, if anything's on the right side of your screen, yeah, over there, maybe you could just read it out loud just to make sure we can. Yeah, uh, I see it on the mini window. Okay. I see it. So when I go uh -huh. to the small view, I'm going to start to share it again. That might fix it. I've not seen this before. It could be because I'm optimized. Um, yeah, it's still there. Isn't it? It's still there. Hmm. I've never seen this before. I'm sorry, guys. All right, y'all yeah, have to do what you said. I will um, dictate if there's something on the bottom right. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. So we talked about different audience segments. And on the left, you see the two that are what we would say are more ambivalent about the um, vaccine, as opposed to the group we're going to show you on the right, which is more resistant. So the pragmatic concern group are things like, I don't have time, I don't know where, I don't know what it costs. And we'll talk about the strategies that we would use for this group. But again, they have enough positive motivation that they would classify as ambivalent. Then there's the wait and see group, or not us first, let someone else be the guinea pigs. Again, they're ambivalent. This is where most African Americans fit during most of the pandemic, although most of those folks have ended up getting um, the vaccine. And then there's the group that I think we're all worried about, the hard no ideologue. We showed you data that they are um, more likely to be white, male, rural, pro-Trump, Republican, lower SES, and younger. We also showed you, as we shared with you a few minutes back, and this might be blocked out by the gray box, that there's a series of both personality attributes and beliefs they have that are very strong in this hard no, I am never going to get it group. So they're open to... Um, uh, they're resistant to start with, but they also have the personality trait of reactant. They they don't like being told what to do. They're high on dogmatism. They endorse general conspiracy beliefs and believe in the end of times is a good thing. They tend to be politically conservative. Now, the challenge is this group has resistance that is aligned with their deeper values. And they are in their mind fighting for truth and justice. They are doing God's work by not getting the vaccine. It's the devil's work to get the vaccine. This is part of their personal assertive autonomy by not getting the vaccine. This is part of the expression of their faith and freedom and being a good American. What that means is we have a very difficult challenge. Unlike smokers or, or most um, folks who are addicted to substances, they don't believe they were put on earth to be a heroin addict. They almost always believe that um, that's inconsistent with God's vision or being a good American. But in this case, resistance to the vaccine aligns with their deeper core values. And so we're going to have to talk about what strategies can MI offer. We know they're not going to respond to argument, that if you argue with the highly resistant ideologue, um, it's only going to entrench them. You have to be careful because they come in with an anti-science, anti-vax, anti-pharmaceutical industry bias that it is something we have to either work with or around. They view that COVID policies are an act of political oppression, and therefore it's an act of personal assertion of your freedom to not get vaccinated or uh, to not wear your mask. So here's some of the strategies that we would do for each of these different segments. And so for the pragmatic concerns, we would actually do problem solving. If they don't know where it is, how much it costs, how long it takes, we would actually sit with them and say, well, let's investigate these. So for that group, education is probably very helpful. For the wait and see group, the most important thing, of course, is letting time expire. And time has expired since the vaccine came on the market. And most of the wait and see group has, in fact, been vaccinated. But for them, we know it's important that we do establish and acknowledge without arguing that there has been historical racism and that may be a factor in how the vaccine rollout occurred. We don't want to argue with them. We want to acknowledge it and affirm it. And then we want to make sure that the information of vaccine comes from trusted sources. We also will use the ask, tell, ask. We'll use it up here as well. I just ran out of space. And we'll show you what the ask, tell, ask strategy looks like. So then what can we do with the hard no, definitely not group? So first of all, it's 20% of the US. 
um, says I will never get any vaccine whatsoever. So first of all, we have to use affirmation. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And affirmation includes statements like, you really are trying to do the right thing for you and your family. You have researched this a lot. You care about your health. You're trying to make the right decision. You wanted to say things that are stroking, that are not condescending and are not empty and hollow, that you can say with sincerity, that are not counter arguments. We're going to roll with resistance. Generally, if someone says, I, I think the pharmaceutical industry is making billions of dollars with this, we would probably not bother to argue. Say, well, it's actually only one billion. It's not two billion. Instead, we would say, you're really worried that the vaccine industry is profiteering from this. You simply restate what they've said. That's called reflective listening, which we'll talk about today, without out arguing. Generally, providing information and counter argument to a group that's high on reactants and high on dogmatism might actually cause harm in the form of reactants. So we have had some experimental uh, studies where we've tested raising doubt and we have gotten some success. So little, what we say, innocent Lieutenant Columbo, if you remember that show from the 70s, yeah, I'm a little confused. It's interesting how the Fox News hosts talk about the vaccine as being evil and the vaccine is being rushed, but it turns out they're all vaccinated. I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand that. What do you make of that? It's called innocent bewilderment. We're not saying you're an idiot for not understanding this. We're not judging them. We're laying out this interesting paradox and letting them hopefully digest it in front of us. We call that you provide, they decide. You provide raw information, they decide how to interpret it. If you interpret it for them, it actually can create reactants. So if you say, and therefore you're a fool for listening to the Fox News entertainment group, then you're going to enter into reactants, where if you put it out in this inquisitive, neutral, Lieutenant Columbo style, it may actually be a useful strategy. We also know there's certain sources that seem to be more valuable for the hard no, definitely not group. So let's begin. I'll ask someone, I have my chat feature. Um, yes, I'm looking at the chat, Dr. Holmes, exactly. Thank you. So I'm going to show you how not to do it. I'm going to show you someone using non-MI, and I just need someone in the chat to say you're hearing it. I did, I did click optimize for sound, but I won't know until I click it. Here we go. Hi, Sam. Have you been vaccinated yet? Um, no, I haven't. You really should get the vaccine. People who haven't gotten the vaccine at this point are severely misinformed. Vaccines are safe and effective, and there really isn't a reason to worry about side effects. But... I am worried about the side effects. I don't want to have to miss work. Okay. Would you rather have to miss work for a couple of days after getting vaccinated, or would you rather die of COVID? The choice really is simple. Look, I, I just don't know. Well, if you really want to die of COVID, that's your choice. But at least I warned you. This is that tone that creates reactants. This is counter argument. This gentleman needed someone to roll with resistance, acknowledge his fears, and not try to judge. She wasn't successful at that. Hi, Sam. Now, we're going to talk today about four strategies, reflections, open questions, ask, tell, ask, and affirmations. And philosophically, we're going to talk about dancing, not boxing. And that means if someone says something that's inaccurate, distorted, um, outright false. In general, we're going to roll with it. We're going to still reflect that's what you believe versus jumping in to counter argue. When we do want to provide new information, we'll use the ask, tell, ask approach. If it's okay, I'd like to share with some, with you some information. Here it is. What do you make of it? And I'll show you some in the video clips. First, I want to show you what we mean by reflection. Many of you already know, but reflection is restating back to the person what you believe they said, and in some cases, why you think they said it. In the clip I'm about to show you, we're simply going to show you how the um, office person is reflecting back the fear of this person. I'm just really struggling right now. I lost my job. It's hard to make ends meet. And on top of that, my mother was just diagnosed with COVID. I, I really don't know what to do at this point. This has been a brutal time for you. You are feeling overwhelmed after losing your job and because your mother has COVID. Yeah, that's it. There's just so much going on right now. It, it all seems so, I don't know, hopeless. Thank you for letting me know. I wonder if you'd be open to getting a call back from one of our clinic team members 
to see if there is some way we might be able to help. Well, I'm not sure what you'll be able to do, but I guess it can't hurt to talk to someone. Sure. I will let our team know, and hopefully someone can get back to you soon. In the meantime, I wonder if we could talk about the COVID vaccine. I'm just really struggling. The key thing here is in the first uh, 10, 15 seconds of the clip, where the, uh, the healthcare provider reflects back the emotional state of the person. When you reflect, you build rapport, lowers defensiveness, and opens them up to taking information exchange. So we mentioned we're going to use a lot of affirmations. Here are some that you could be using, hopefully, tomorrow if you were to be talking with a hesitant person. Take a look at these affirmative statements. Now, in each case, this person still could be hesitant or resistant. This person may not be willing to get the vaccine, but you can still nonetheless reflect back something positive about their intent or about their openness to figuring this out. Now, this is a, on the bottom three, a very particular type of affirmation when the person is at least ambivalent. If the person has some ambivalence and says, well, maybe, and there's a tiny crack in the door, you want to reflect that back. We have some pretty good data and data from many other researchers on motivational interviewing that if there is any intentionality in the patient reflecting that back, it's called change talk, reflect back their change talk, even if it's mild, jumbled, and buried, it's still generally useful to reflect back. But part of you thinks the vaccine might be of value. So let's take a look at an exchange here with and without motivational interviewing. Let's start with this client statement. So I'll just have you read it to yourselves. So here's clearly someone who has some um, beliefs and some sort of emotional resistance to the vaccine. Here's a non-MI response. This is what we say, true but useless information. They're not ready to hear this. This correction will probably just create um, reactants. It's going to entrench the person. This is not what they wanted to hear. They didn't want to be corrected. So instead, here's a more reflective, affirming approach that uses some core MI strategies. Now, you may ask, aren't you causing harm? Aren't you endorsing these beliefs? Aren't you implicitly saying, I agree with you? And the answer is no. What this does is it builds rapport with the person. It de-escalates the tension in the room. And the thing we want to point out is the language is you feel versus I agree. So although you may feel it's just semantics, we have found it's a very big difference of communication when you say, I agree, the pharmaceutical industry is lying. That is a different communication say, you really don't trust the pharmaceutical industry. So the short bit of advice I can give you as you're starting to learn motivational interviewing is start your reflections with you. You can reflect with I, we, it, but they are at times high risk reflections because it may sound like you're personally endorsing the person's belief. When you say you feel, you think, you generally avoid that trap. So you words are safer than I or we or it. Let's take a look at another case. Here we're talking mm -hmm. about the vaccine for kids. Could you read the, the new? Uh, the okay, oh, that's being blocked by the- Thank um, you so much. Yeah, by the mysterious gray box. Okay, so I will do when we get to the MI one, I'll read it. All right, so here's one talking about um, not wanting the vaccine for their kids. Here's the old school response counter argument, jumping in and correcting before you reflected. So in the MI response, we would say something like, you're worried about the long-term side effects of the vaccine that might not have been found yet, and you don't want to take that risk for you or your family. You're trying to do the right thing, and for now, getting vaccinated, not getting vaccinated feels like the best thing for you and your family. Rolling with resistance. Now keep in mind, we are going to at some point Ask them if they're open to new information, but that's not our opening salvo. That's the old school approach where you quickly come in. It's called the writing reflex. When you quickly come in and correct misinformation, 
Instead, we're going to build rapport first. We're going to establish, I hear you, you have concerns. And implicitly in this statement, although the gray box is blocking it a wee bit, um, it's implying that I don't think you're crazy or stupid. And that's the meta message of these types of reflective statements. It establishes a common ground that even if I personally don't agree, I hear you and I understand you. Let's take a look at a third case. Clearly, there's some misinformation here. You could, in the old school approach, come in and fix it, right? You can come in and correct them. But as you're now learning, we want to first, before we do any information exchange, any knowledge correction, instead, we want to come in and build rapport. And it says here, while you have some concerns about the vaccine, part of you feel it would protect your mother, and you don't want to be responsible for her getting sick. It sounds like finding answers to your questions about the safety of the vaccine might help you decide. Now, this is actually a very sophisticated reflection down here. This is called an action reflection. This is taking what they've said and converting it into a positive step. So it sounds like researching a little bit about the safety might help you decide or might help you protect your mother. So have that one in your back pocket. It sounds like if we could figure out how to overcome this, this is called making lemonade out of lemons. This is a very powerful way to handle information gaps. Hey, sounds like if we could research this a little bit, it might help you decide. So that's uh, three examples of how MI approaches might differ from traditional care. And let me go back now and just give you a little bit of theoretical or conceptual background about MI. Um, it was developed by Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick in the 90s, primarily as a treatment for substance abuse, as an alternative to coercive or punitive substance use treatments where people would lose their job if they didn't stop drinking. It's more autonomy supportive. It lets the person drive and steer. And the essence of MI is captured in this beautiful expression. First, you comfort the afflicted, and then you afflict the comfortable. Comfort the afflicted includes this type of reflective response that I just showed you, which is called rolling with the resistance. That's the dance, not a boxing match. It's basically starting out by agreeing with the person, even though we don't want to land there. We don't want to end there. We want to end with them yielding or changing their opinion. The original approach, the first thing you do is simply reflect it back without arguing. But then we may have to afflict the comfortable. And that might include finding meaning as Meaning, so how would you feel if you brought COVID home and your mother got sick? How would you feel if you got sick and you had to take off of work and lose your income for a while? Afflicted comfortable can also mean giving them information that makes them a little unsettled. For example, the vast majority of people who are dying are either unvaccinated or elderly, and you have both in your mother in your home. What do you make of that? So sometimes afflicting the comfortable is providing neutral information and letting them digest that information. It's uncomfortable. That's effort in order to accommodate information that's inconsistent with your current beliefs. Let me show you a wonderful clip that captures why we first roll with the resistance, why we first acknowledge feelings and don't come in with fixing too soon. Take a look. Oh, the stuffed animal hall of fame. My rocket! Wait, Rally and I were still using that rocket. It, it, it still has some song power left. Who is your friend who likes to play? No! No, 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 you can't take my rocket to the dock. Rally and I are going to the moon. Riley can't be done with me. It's going to be okay. We can fix this. We just need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? I had a whole trip planned for us. <gasps> hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, Bing Bong, look at this. Oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone. 
forever. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness! That sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on. The train station is this way. So I hope you could see old school and new school. Joy was the old school. Joy came in to fix it, distract him. Let's move on. Get over it. Sadness came in and rolled with the resistance. She used reflective statements to express empathy. And what that accomplishes something that's very important that we call draining the swamp. Bing Bong was not ready to move on until he felt someone understood how hard it was to see what he just had to go through with his best friend's toy being trashed prematurely. The key thing is, before you give any information or advice, before you fix, before you problem solve, first reflect back the person's feelings. Here's another clip that captures it wonderfully. And here's the expression we use if you haven't seen this before. I don't care what you know until I know that you care. Take a look. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. You do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just. Sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! So in terms of vaccine hesitance, I hope you're all chuckling. What this reinforces both of those clips is before you come in with new information, before you start solving, reflect back their fears and their barriers, establish that you've heard them. That's this new step that we're introducing to your communication repertoire. Now, MI is based on the principles of self-determination theory. And I'm just going to give you a quick two-slide primer on self-determination theory. There's thousands of papers that have shown that there are three human needs in almost every culture on the planet, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. If you meet those three needs, people will change in the positive direction. So what that means is we wanna make sure whoever you're talking to, that you communicate, this is up to you. This is your choice. It's completely your decision. That's important to establish their autonomy or in more simple terms, that they're in this, they're running the steering wheel. Number two, competence, that they have to feel that they're able to do this, that it's not too complicated. In this case, it may be making sure you don't give information that's too advanced. If you give information that's too advanced or complicated, that lowers their competence, that pushes them away from the vaccine. And finally, relatedness, we want to show them how getting the vaccine improves their social and family situation, and not getting the vaccine hurts their family or social situation. The second observation I want to share with you from self-determination theory is that we no longer look at how much motivation someone has. We look at what type. Another way we say it is we're more interested in the quality of your motivation than the quantity of your motivation. And therefore, we're looking to achieve autonomous motivation. We want people to choose the vaccine volitionally and because it aligns with their values. We don't want to try and pressure or shame or guilt them. Now, as I've said, the biggest challenge is 
many vaccine hesitant, particularly in the hard no category, have autonomous reasons not to get vaccinated. They feel they are volitionally doing something that honors God's work and that is consistent with American values. And that's the challenge is how do we afflict that? That's comforting to them. How do we afflict that? We'll talk about that in a few minutes, I hope. So let me give you some practical communication tips. If you want to use controlled motivation and you want to tell people how to do something, look at the language on the left. You must, you should, you have to. Once in a while, this type of language works. It may work when someone is very exhausted or someone doesn't want to investigate something. Then having a directive counselor like this is helpful. But that is a pretty rare person. Most people prefer the autonomous style. And I hope you can see on the right, and maybe that gray box is doing its nasty bit, so I'll read the bottom ones. You have the answer. Let us help you find the answer. Why might you consider doing this? How might you go about it? It's helped others. This might help you. These sort of tentative challenges are far more autonomy supportive than telling someone you must, you should, you have to, you better. So we want you to practice using tentative language, pose questions. How might getting the vaccine help you? What can we do to answer your concerns? What information would be helpful to you? Pose questions versus commands. Use tentative language versus definitive language. Here's some more autonomy supportive language that is relevant to vaccine hesitance communications. Take a look. This is called autonomy support, fancy schmancy term for supporting the person's right to self-determination. So let's talk for a few minutes about the concrete skills, and then we'll open up for some conversation. But I want to spend a few minutes telling you about good open questions and effective reflections. So first of all, good open questions can't be answered yes, no. So the classic way we um, explain this is, a closed question is, are you depressed today? An open question is, is, how do you feel today? A closed question is, are you worried about this? An open question is, how if at all does this trouble you? So we're going to try and use more open questions. Everything on the left is an open question starter. So take a look. Now, we'll be sharing the slides with you so you don't have to jot them down, but take a look at these questions. We're particularly interested in teaching what, if any, when, if ever, how, if at all. What, if any, questions do you have about the vaccine? How, if at all, would this information change your point of view? We're going to generally discourage did you, will you, can you, is it? Those create binary yes, no questions. There's a time and place. Do you have your insurance card with you? Did you schedule your appointment? There are some binary things in the world for which a closed question is useful. But anything related to emotion and intention in general should be asked with an open question, such as those on the left-hand side of your screen. Another approach you want to teach you is called the goalpost question. And what it does is establishes a wide range of normal. Some people are like this, but other people are like that. So I'm going to use something completely unrelated to vaccine just to prove the, um, to provide an example. You could ask someone if you're having a conversation about a delicate topic, let's say about abortion for which there's a very strong opinions on both sides of the fence. You could say a direct open question is what are your thoughts of, on abortion? We wouldn't recommend that. We would recommend the goalpost. So the goalpost would go like this. Some people feel abortion is murder and should be protected. No one should be allowed to do it. It should be uh, eliminated from our society. Other people feel abortion is a normal medical procedure for which society should not interfere between the patient and doctor and should be left up to the woman. What are your thoughts? That's called a goalpost question. You're setting up two wide ranging responses and allowing the person to kick the ball in between the goalposts. So here's how it might look for COVID vaccine hesitance. Some people really trust the COVID recommendations from the CDC, while others feel the CDC isn't telling the whole truth. That's an example of some people, some people diametrically opposed opinions that are set up as the goalposts. Some people want to get the booster as soon as possible, while others want no part of it. That's the goalposts. And in this case, we're going to put a middle point. Others just want to wait and see before they decide. This is the third goalpost right here. 
So let's quickly see if we could convert a couple of these um, closed-ended questions to open questions. I have the chat open on my phone. So if anyone wants to go ahead, here's the closed-ended version. Are you ready to get your COVID vaccine? Who would like to make an open version of that? You're welcome to unmute if that is allowed on this call. If not, uh, you may have typed and then the people minding it may have to read it back to me. And if that doesn't work, I'll just give you the answers. All right, I'm guessing it's too hard to do it. So I'm gonna give you the answers one at a time. You could say in a scale of zero to 10, how ready are you to get the vaccine? Will your husband help you arrange your vaccine? How helpful, if at all, do you expect your husband to be? What help, if any, will he be? Have you learned anything? Yes, if you can get anything to Jenny, she'll share it with me. Have you learned anything from seeing unvaccinated people fall ill and die? Even though it's a good afflict the comfortable type of question, it's a little bit too pushy, a little bit too judgy. It will probably cause reactants because it has a judgmental tone. So to make it more neutral, you have to learn how to use that Lieutenant Columbo neutrality. Nothing but the facts. Good, what are your biggest concerns? Thank you. I think maybe Liz is uh, channeling someone else's, I'm not sure. Are fertility and blood clots your biggest concerns? What are your biggest concerns? What, if anything, concerns you? Some people are concerned about blood clots. Other people, it doesn't affect them. If you do get a yes, no answer, it is um, helpful to have these probes in your back pocket. These are ways to get more information. If someone says, yeah or no, these are wonderful probes to dig you out of a closed-ended grave. Take a look at them. Now let's talk about reflections. Reflections are statements versus questions. And in general, we wanna end with a downturn. You're upset with him versus you're upset with him. When you do reflections right, we establish rapport with you and the, and the speaker. And that is critical because if you wanna be a trusted source of information, you have to first establish rapport. That's what reflections do. When you reflect, this is communicated to the person. I'm trying to listen to you. I'm trying to track your story. I'm trying to understand your point of view, I'm trying to accept you for who you are. I'm not going to judge or push you. All of that is implicit inside reflections. They're very powerful communications. They carry a lot of what we call meta messaging, a lot of secondary communication. Let me give you um, an example. We could ask the open ended question How well do you think people understand you? That's a good open question. It's perfectly fine, perfectly adept. But we strongly recommend if you can construct it into a reflection such as, hey, when I listen to you, you feel that nobody truly understands you. Notice how the second one on the bottom has more empathy than the question. The question has more curiosity. I'm trying to figure out and trying to diagnose you, but the reflective statement conveys I'm trying to accept you. Let's do another one. Hey, how did they make you feel? Versus you feel really sad about that. When you reflect, you establish rapport, you communicate that you're listening. So here's how we construct reflections. There are various clauses that we can use. It sounds like, in other words, you're saying, so you're saying that. I think you might be saying, correct me if I'm wrong. I hear you saying. It almost sounds like. These are all wonderful ways to construct a reflective statement. Now, ultimately, we could cut off this part and this part and just jump to you. So this is called the short form of reflection. And it just starts with the word you. Both are fine. There's a little bit of um, caution about saying it sounds like too many times in an encounter. At some point, the listener starts to get a little bit um, creeped out by it. So at some point, we'd like you to start to use you statements. So let me show you a couple of reflective statements. Now, the examples I'm going to give you are from a pediatric obesity study because we have very good clips of it. But take a look, and then we'll get some COVID uh, examples in a minute. What I hear from you is when he's active, you're happy. Like when he's moving yes, around, when he's moving around and you he's feel active, like you're I'm being really a better mom. Happy. Yeah, I do. I do. Exactly. So I want to show you some clips that use MI in the context of COVID vaccine. I mentioned we're gonna introduce the ask, tell, ask strategy. And basically if someone says, I'm terrified about the vaccine because it causes you to become infertile, they've given you some misinformation that you wanna correct. 
But the ask, tell, ask strategy first recommends that you reflect whatever feeling. You're terrified that the vaccine is going to make you infertile. We do not initially counter argue. So the first thing we do is reflect their fear. Then we ask for permission. If it's okay, it might pay to talk about this. That's the first ask. You provide the information and then you ask them to interpret it in front of you. So here's how we would use the MI strategies we talked about for someone who has wait and see type of hesitance, more logistic concerns, ambivalence, if you remember. Hey, Sam. Hey, Sheila. Hey, you signed up for the Getting to Yes program, and you said you had some concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine. I'm not against the vaccine, and I don't want to get really sick from COVID. I just don't have time to get it. I have to leave right after work to pick up my kids from school, and I can't miss work. And I'm not quite sure where to get it. So you're interested in getting the vaccine. It's just been too hard to find a time and a place for it. Yeah, I'm just so busy. You have so much going on in your life right now. It sounds like if you could find a convenient time and place to get the vaccine, you would probably be open to it. If it was easy, I think I would get it. Okay, you get vaccinated if it didn't interfere with work. If it's okay with you, I'd like to share some ideas that have worked with other people. Okay. Some people try to get vaccinated on a weekend or in the evening. Other people ask their employer for some time off to get the vaccine. What do you think about any of these? Yeah, I guess if I didn't have to miss work and I didn't have to stay home to recover, then maybe. There's a website that lists all the available vaccine times and days in our community. Because of time, I'm going to cut that scene so short, but you saw how first she reflected, then she um, used that powerful strategy. It sounds like you could overcome this barrier. You might be open to it. That's that change talk reflection. And then she used ask, tell, ask to do some problem solving. Hey, Sam. Now let's take a look at another form of the ambivalent, the wait and see person. Hey, Sam. Hey, Sheila. Hey, you signed up for the Getting to Yes program, and you said you had some concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine. I don't know how I feel about the vaccine. I don't want to go first, and I don't want to be experimented on. And who knows what the long-term side effects are? I know it probably works. I just don't know that it's 100% safe. Your primary concern is the long-term side effects and not feeling you're being experimented on. Because of that, you want to wait and see. But you care about your health, and you know that the vaccine will probably be protective for you. Notice the reflection and the affirmation. Hey, Sam. Now, this is the case that I think everyone's scared of. Here's the person who is more definitely not, the hard no. So in this case, we're not necessarily going to fix them, but we're just establishing that we're going to keep open lines of communication. We're going to avoid making them run away and feel judged. We're going to roll with the resistance and affirm as much as we can. This is the hardest communication. Let's take a look. Hey, Sam. Hey, Sheila. Hey, you signed up for the Getting to Yes program, and you said you had some concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine. You got a minute to talk? Yeah, there's no way I'm getting the vaccine. They really rushed it. We don't know what the long-term side effects might be. Getting the vaccine scares you. You're trying to do the right things for your health, and at this point, getting the vaccine seems risky to you. Yeah, I'm not stupid. If it were safe, I would consider it. But I don't trust that they're telling us the truth about the side effects or about COVID. So if you could be sure that there wouldn't be any long-term side effects, then part of you might be interested in getting the vaccine. We call that prying open the door. That's just a little crack on the door. Maybe if we could show they were safe, you might be interested. Tentative and respectful. Hey, Sam. So I'm just going to show you two more clips. We have about 10, and I'll make sure we get these to you. Here's how you would specifically handle a very concrete piece of misinformation using ask, tell, ask. I'm thinking about it, but I'm worried. I'm worried that the vaccines were developed too quickly. We don't know what the long-term effects of the vaccine might be, you know? You are concerned about getting a COVID vaccine because it was developed so quickly. You're really trying to figure out if this is right for you. It's important to know if the vaccine is safe. 
you're thinking about getting the vaccine, but you need more information before you can decide. Our doctors here have thought about this as well. Is it okay if I share their thoughts with you? So reflect, affirm, and then go into ask, tell, ask. I'll just show you one more. Um, I, I'll show you I don't, who impacts fertility. Here we go. I read that I won't be able to have kids if I get the vaccine. It's not for me. Okay. You're worried it might affect your ability to have healthy children. The COVID vaccines are new. It's normal for you to have questions. Our doctors here have thought about this as well. Is it okay for me to share their thoughts with you? Sure. Based on everything that we know, there is no reason to believe that the vaccine will affect a person's ability to have children. Neutral provision of information. And then if I let the clip run, it would ask the uh, woman who's calling from home, what do you make of this? I All right, so to summarize before we open to discussion, use open questions, use reflections, affirm their sincerity of the fact that they're trying to do the right thing. Where it makes sense, offer problem-solving assistance and avoid this stuff. This is gonna create reactance. This is gonna push the person away. This is gonna shut down communication. All right, I'm sorry I ran a little late, but I'm here for questions. So helpful. One question that came through was whether or how to bring in your own vaccine experiences as part of the conversation. Yeah. So one of the guiding principles about sharing personal anecdote is asking um, for permission and to say, if it would be at all helpful, I'd be happy to share my experience with the vaccine. So to let them feel they're controlling that information exchange. So there is a time and place for it, but we like to sort of ask for permission and integrate it into the ask, tell, ask routine. If it's okay with you, I'd like to share my personal experience, if that might be helpful. When we do share personal experience, we do have one important caveat, and that is what worked for me may not work for you, how I, my side effects may not be your side effects. So whenever you're sharing your personal experience, we ask you to put some meat tenderizer on it and lower expectations that the person's experience will mirror yours. And that's done with those sort of statements that I just um, listed. Everyone's different. I'm not sure this will be exactly the same for you. That's good advice. Jasmine, does that answer your question or do you have any follow-up on that? One other question that arose for me, I know a lot of our um, partners are working on COVID vaccines, but also other adult vaccines like flu. And I'm wondering if you have any specific insights into how any of these would need to be shaped if, um, yeah. go ahead. So historically, um, the three audience segments we've talked about have also existed in the general vaccine world. There's definitely the hard no group um, and the, you know, the Jenny McCarthy group and the Kennedy group. Um, and there's been less of the wait and see because most of the vaccines have been on the market for a while. So it's mostly practical concerns and hard no. So two of the three audience segments map on to other vaccines. The good news is the strategies are virtually identical, that it's the same set of Roll with the assistance, affirm, ask, tell, ask, don't judge, don't use commands, a support autonomy. So interestingly, some people have pointed out that the general vaccine hesitance may have solidified, become stronger during the era of COVID that has really made the um, um, general vaccine hesitance more hard no than wait and see and more hard no than um, logistical concerns. That's an interesting uh, and I think we'll know more data in a year or two from now, if that's in fact happened, that the COVID hard no has started to migrate into the general vaccine hard maybe no. Another question that came through was whether there are any studies that you know of that would be beneficial for folks to look at, um, I guess, to convey to, to those who might be hesitant due to vaccine safety specifically. Yeah, so there's some survey data that you could find in several different websites. Kaiser has a good one, um, and I think Pew, where they ask people, what would it take to change your mind? And so I think, um, again, I will share those links uh, so they'll get into your hands. And there are a couple of intervention studies that have already been published and many more that are being reviewed as we speak, where people tried various educational or counter-messaging strategies 
um, and that has there's been some successful trials and more coming. We're in the middle of one ourselves. We're just recruiting people now around the um, Omicron bivalent booster using these strategies. Fantastic. Well, thank you for another really excellent uh, webinar. So much information to take in. We'll be wrapping up soon. While we close, we have a, a poll, if you all wouldn't mind providing some feedback on the webinar today for our reporting. And then I also would like to share with you a couple of upcoming events. The first one I will mention is directly related to all of this work. I'll be um, putting the chats in right now. These are follow-up interactive workshops on this exact issue conducted by one of our PAVE members, Lantern Community Services. And we have two of those. One is exclusively in English and one is exclusively in Spanish. And the Spanish one will not be using interpreters. So it's just conducted in Spanish. Um, we have only limited spots for these and there will be a wait list. So if you, um, if you don't get in, if you want to get in, go ahead and do it quickly. And if you are not able to get in, then please join the wait list in case we can uh, do anything to accommodate you later. And then the second one that I'm putting in right now is Celebrate Pave. This is our end of the year event. Uh, and, just celebrating all the great work that all of you do to advance vaccine equity. It will include some door prizes, a highlight reel, some fun. So join us for something a little less serious than all of this. And um, this is reserved only for PAVE uh, funded partners, just so you know. So um, as you can all see in the chat, people are really excited about all of um, the information they've gotten today and how practical and applicable it is. So I will join them in thanking you, Dr. Resnikow, for all your insights and tips and um, thank all of you for joining us today and for all that you do. Um, we will conclude this now and thanks again to everybody. Stay well and have happy holidays. <laughs>